greatness inside of each and every one of you. everybody and to those of you joining online don't you love that av isn't that just typical clive the music in the background come on let's give our dream teamers and all of our volunteers a great big god bless you for serving so faithfully 10 years in the car park and you see takes a passion for you. we love you clive and thank you for that wonderful testimony well you ready for the word this evening i'm really be, i'm really grateful to the lord for this opportunity i'm going to be teaching on a wonderful subject um, a lesson that I learned several years ago that really just transformed my outlook on life and my walk with God. And so this message I'm preparing tonight is um, presenting tonight is very, very personal. The title of my message is how to remain hopeful in hopeless situations. How to remain hopeful in hopeless situations. I just wanna pray, so won't you just stretch your hands towards me as you um, prepare to receive and I prepare to teach. Father, I thank you for the privilege that I have of teaching your family tonight, your word that brings life specifically on this wonderful subject of hope. You are a God of hope. And if we are truly to serve you and have faith in you and believe in you, we're to remain hopeful, even in the most hopeless of circumstances. Thank you for this wonderful gift of hope that has been given to us even as we get born again, just like salvation. Thank you tonight, Lord, that you teach us how to tap into this endless supply of hope. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome again to all of you online. I don't know where you find yourselves, but folks, let me tell you I'm speaking from experience. There have been several times in my life, and I'm not proud to admit it, that I've been completely hopeless. Many of you know my testimony, some of you don't, but it was just 14 short years ago where my wife, Pastor Christine, and I, our marriage was completely on the rocks. Both of us found ourselves in a hopeless situation. We were separated and headed for divorce. Thank God we are here today. But the reason we're here today is because the lessons that the Lord showed me during that time. I went to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm hopeless. I don't think there's any way out until God led me on a journey that brought me back to restoration. And what I'm gonna be teaching about tonight is part of that. I've been hopeless in my life financially. I remember as a young pastor, um, I'd managed to get into two vehicle accidents without insurance. And I was facing this huge mammoth giant of debt and um, I could not chip away at it. I got to a place where I believed God could do everything else. But in that era of my life, I was completely hopeless. I found myself also hopeless 10 years ago when my dad passed away. He was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver and we believed that he would still survive a while. It was 30 days later that he passed away. But I remember in the last two weeks of my father's hospitalization that I became completely hopeless. It affected the way I spoke. It affected the way I live. And really, you're gonna find out tonight that even though we do face hopeless situations, and I don't know what yours is, I don't know if you find yourself currently completely hopeless as far as your business is concerned. With the president speaking tonight and another lockdown pending, wondering what's gonna happen next. I don't know, that may be you. You may be here tonight and find yourself in a completely hopeless situation in your marriage and all you see is darkness. There just seems to be no way out for you. I believe tonight that this message is gonna bless you. It is good news. And I'm telling you tonight, what I'm trusting God for is that in a moment, God is gonna turn your hopeless situation around. That regardless of whether the circumstances may change immediately for you or not, something's gonna happen. There's gonna, there's gonna become, a, there's a shift in your spirit. If Andrew was standing here tonight and I was listening to him as he led praise and worship tonight and I don't know where he is, Andrew, wave at me. If you're around, won't you just wave, grab my attention. I'm sure he's somewhere around here. But if you ask Andrew, I bet you Andrew found himself at one point in time in a hopeless situation wondering whether he will ever have a child. I mean, God threw so many curveballs at this young worship leader. Young, notice Andrew, I want some points for that. This young worship leader, God threw so many curveballs at him that he must have been at a place where he was wondering, am I ever going to have a legacy or a child? And guess what? His baby just turned one year old. So God is in the business of turning, come on. God is in the business of turning things around. And I believe that's what the Lord is gonna do to you tonight. So let's dig into the Word. I'm gonna be teaching you the theology of hope, if that's okay. 
I'm gonna be giving you a lot of scripture. Let's see where we land this plane. I've included my entire study for you on the notes, on the, on the app. So you can get the entire study. I don't have time to get through the entire thing tonight, but I know that it'll bless you for those of you that access it and download it. So let's take a look at three abiding realities. Three abiding realities. Because you see, hope is unlike any other subject. When you study the subject of hope and read the scriptures of hope, they have this, they have this way of just completely illuminating your life. Uh, I don't know how many of you, I mean, smartphones are great, but I don't know how many of you have ever taken a photo and it, the colors were just kind of insipid. I mean, you looked at the photograph, you saw it with your natural eyes, it looked amazing, you lined up the shot, you took the picture, but when you looked at it on your, sand, on your phone, especially if it's an iPhone, it just really, <laughs> sorry, it just, it just really looked bland and lifeless. You know what I'm talking about? Hey, I've got Samsung so I can, I'm preaching. So, but I'm using an iPhone as an example, you know? And so you looked at the picture, but it just didn't, it wasn't all that. How many of you know, now iPhone users, I know, you're not gonna raise your hands. But I mean, how many of you know what I'm talking about? And then they got this wonderful, they got this wonderful thing on the, on the, on the uh, it's called effects. And, you, and you, it's auto-correct kind of thing for, for pictures, right? And you look at this insipid photograph and you, and you just click on this auto-correct, all of a sudden, pah, this thing just, how many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you use that filter? And you know, hope is like that. And perhaps you find yourself in a situation where if I were to take a snapshot of your current situation, I mean, the, it's just got no color. It's lifeless. You know, can I tell you what I'm trusting God for tonight? I'm trusting God that in the spirit, we're just gonna tap that little autocorrect and all of a sudden, everything's gonna change for you. That's where my hope is at tonight. And I believe God can do it for you. Can someone say amen? Can someone say amen? And for those of you that are in our venues. So let's dig into these three abiding realities. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13, the Bible says, three things will last forever. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. So even though you may feel hopeless, let me tell you, just around the corner is the new you, full of the hope and the life of God. I'm about to teach you why possibly your hope in the Lord or your hope that your circumstances would change has perhaps leaked out and produced the hopelessness that you currently feel. Paul presents three great abiding realities of the Christian faith. Other things may come and go, other things may seem important for a season or specific situation, but the things that abide forever are these three. Now, most Christians have heard a lot about faith. They've been taught a lot about love, but hope, and I was so encouraged when Pastor Theo recently taught on the realities of heaven, because you know, sometimes our hope stops short of just praying that our circumstances will change. But when you think of things in the light of eternity, everything just begins to make sense. Courage is drawn. Courage is pulled from the fact, guess what? That Jesus can do it and Jesus can change it. So hope will do for you what faith cannot. They're not the same thing. Why do I say that? Well, because the Bible teaches us that hope is the anchor of our souls. Take a look at this verse in Hebrews 6, verses 18 through 19. Listen carefully. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is, the strong, is a strong and trustworthy anchor of our soul. Say this, hope is an anchor for my soul, not faith. Hope is an anchor for my soul. Your soul is made up of three parts, your mind, will, and emotions. So really, the stability within your mind and to be able to control your emotions and to act according to the scripture is all based and anchored in hope. The moment hope is gone or hopelessness comes in, all of a sudden, you begin to understand why emotionally we fall apart. I've met hopeless people before. 
They try and exercise their faith. And it really is quite tragic because faith cannot work outside of hope. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of thing. <laughs> of thing. <laughs> faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. If you pull out hope, how does faith even work? And so I've met many people that say the right things with their mouths, but you can see emotionally they are so detached from what they are believing God for, their faith cannot work. You see, hope is necessary to maintain both faith and love. These three abiding realities have to be together. Why? Because God is together. So hope is necessary to maintain both faith and love. Unless we have hope, our faith will leak out and our love will fail. Hope is not an option. It's essential for Christian living. Where there is life, there is hope. And where there is hope, there is life. Now listen as I read this following statement. Biblical hope is not the same as worldly hope. Two different things. The world views hope completely differently to the way the Bible teaches us what hope is. Now generally hope is the eager expectation of good. Really that's what it is. A basic definition is the eager expectation of good. When was the last time you woke up with the eager expectation of something good happening to you today? If your marriage is going through a crisis, when was the last time you woke up with this eager expectation that today things are gonna change? As we live in South Africa and take a look at what's happening to us culturally, socioeconomically, when was the last time you woke up in the morning full of hope for what this country has to offer and the possible change that's coming? I must admit, I progressively become more and more cynical over time. Thank God for this opportunity to teach this word because it was a brilliant reminder to me to say, Andre, don't get into hopelessness because to be hopeless is to be godless. That's what we're about to find out, folks. We're gonna see it in scripture. So biblical hope is not the same as worldly hope. True hope is Christ-centered and eternally anchored in Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Tonight, Andrew made a very powerful statement, part of the lyrics of the song, and he says, ultimately our hope is in Jesus. Now we sing it, but do we really know what it means? I'm about to share an illustration with you that I think will bring, it, will bring clarity for you. So true hope is Christ-centered and eternally anchored in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Biblical hope ultimately looks forward but what does it look forward to? It looks forward to Christ's return. And because it does, because ultimately your entire hope is aimed and focused at the return of Jesus, guess what? It is unrelenting. Now I've been told that in order to climb a mountain, if you do not know how to climb, it is absolutely essential that a climber climbs that mountain before you. And the responsibility of the climber that goes up first, his responsibility is not only to scale the mountain from the bottom to the top, but as he makes his way up, his responsibility is to knock in anchor points into the mountain. And as he climbs the mountain and uses all of the effort, all of the strategy, takes all the risk, as he makes his way up, depending on the height of the mountain, he might have three or 400 anchor points until he gets to the top. And then what happens? An inexperienced climber that comes after him will then take his rope and his rope, as he makes these milestones, will be clipped into these anchor points. In case something happens, guess what? He doesn't drop, he doesn't fall, he doesn't die. Now let me work this metaphor a little bit. Jesus was the climber that scaled the mountain on our behalf. And on the way to the top of the mountain, which ultimately is the return of Jesus, it's the end of this life. 
ultimately at the top of the mountain, he stands victorious, ready to pull us up. And as long as our eyes are fixed, knowing that the anchor points and the milestones have been driven in by Jesus, guess what? There is no fear. There actually is no effort at all. But now can you imagine An experienced climber, and this is where we make the mistake sometimes, folks, listen carefully. Those without Jesus or those without hope are attempting to climb that mountain all on their own. And what they're doing is they're living from one anchor point to the next. Their hope is just to make it to that crack in the rock. And then they drive the anchor point in and they rest there a while wondering what is next. The point I wanna make with this message today, and I'm gonna give you the scriptures to back up this illustration, is that if you, if your hope at any given time, if your hope is contingent on your circumstance changing, you are like that climber that is just hoping to knock the next anchor point in, in the hope that he's gonna make it to the top without a guarantee. If your hope is anchored in the fact that when your marriage gets better, that's when you will change or that's when you will transform or when your business begins to make a turnover, you see any sort of anchor or any sort of thing that you place your hope in is temporary, which is why Jesus tells us in the Word of God, it is completely to be anchored on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Our ultimate hope, because listen folks, if you look to Jesus, it's done. If you place your hope in Christ alone, and the fact that He is coming back, Guess what? No matter what happens between the bottom of the mountain and the top of the mountain, it's not gonna affect you because guess what? Jesus is coming back. So my point and the revelation I received is this, that I'm not to hope on the next best thing. I'm not to place my soul, my mind, will, and emotions. I'm not to place the the consistency of those three things on the change in circumstance. Because you know when you got Jesus, and he's climbed to the top of the mountain. It does not matter. Now, I've been counseling, my wife and I have been counseling folks from this congregation that are going through various challenges in their life. And some of these, if you were in the world, some of these honestly should make, would make a person feel hopeless. But my encouragement to every single one of them has been, stop climbing the mountain alone. Place your hope in Jesus' return because guess what? He is coming back. He's coming back soon and whatever happens between now and then is details. We can entrust our future, our life and our family into the hands of Christ. These three abiding realities remain. Faith, hope and love. Can someone say praise the Lord? So here, Paul presents a picture in this next verse. He presents a picture of God's people from Thessalonica enjoying the full, rea- full inheritance of these three, rea- three realities. Look at what he says in 1 Thessalonians 1 verses two to four, he says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love. Notice he doesn't just mention faith, love and hope. I want you to notice how he describes them. He says, without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God, the Father, knowing beloved brethren, your election by God. So Paul took note of the aforementioned abiding realities within the church of Thessalonica. But notice the characteristic that he gives to each expression. First of all, he says, I notice your, fa- your work of faith. Now, for those of you that have ever exercised faith, you'll know it's work. You'll know it's work. When you're exercising faith, everything come again, comes against you, especially when it's over a long period of time, what you're trusting God for. Faith can be work. The Bible says faith without works is dead. So faith can be work. He mentions labor of love. <laughs> As a believer, you'll know that, la- that love can be a labor sometimes. Why? Because we're called to love the unlovely. Be patient with the impatient. Be gentle with the harsh. But then he uses this expression for hope. He says the steadfastness. He says hope 
is or produces a steadfastness in us and an endurance and a perseverance. That doesn't come from faith, folks. It comes from hope. Your steadfastness to endure through stuff comes from hope. And hope is always in the future. Faith is in the present. Now faith is. You can keep your eyes so focused on the now and lose sight of the future. And guess what? The future is bright. You know how I know? Because the Bible says that Jesus is coming back. I can promise you now, folks, in a hundred years from now, if we all endure, we'll be sitting at the marriage feast of the Lamb. And one thing I tell you we will not be talking about is the challenges that you are facing right now. We'll be in glory with Jesus, which is a guarantee. We'll be feasting and talking about how good the Lord is and how wonderful it is to gather with our family that has gone on some of them 20, 30 years before us. We're gonna be sitting and having a party and I promise you nothing you're facing right now, nothing you're facing right now is going to be discussed at that moment. These three remain Faith, hope, and love. We gotta look to the future. The future is bright. So how does hope come, you may ask? This hope that produces steadfast endurance and perseverance, how does it come, Pastor Andre? Well, hope is the direct outcome of the new birth. The direct outcome of the new birth, of being born again by the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus. And not just a general faith, I'm talking about a specific faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Let's take a look at this. Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope. Folks, think about the implications of that for a moment. You have been given a new life into a living hope. Not hope that is temporary, not hope that runs out. You have been given new life, new birth into a living hope. How? Look at this. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Isn't it interesting that Peter would say, from the day you get born again, you've been born again into a living hope. And this hope must be anchored in the fact that guess what? We're going to heaven one day. There is an inheritance for us. And these momentary troubles, this fleeting discomfort that we face right now is just a blimp on the radar. It's just a blimp. Don't allow it to consume you. Don't allow the devil to steal your joy or to rob your hope. Don't allow the devil to get you to take your eyes off where God is taking you and what God has saved you from. Listen, I heard Sherman Owens once say, heaven is everything that's good, hell is everything that's bad and we live somewhere in between. But the difference is we're not like anybody else because we've got Jesus and these abiding realities live with us, inside of us because they are part of the nature and character God of God Himself. Faith, hope, and love. Say this after me. Say this according to God's word. I have been born again into a living hope. Not a dead theological idea, but a living hope through my belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because you know what? If you continue to hope, as surely as Jesus was raised to life again, so you too will be raised to life again. The future is bright. Can someone say, praise the Lord? If you cannot believe and draw courage and hope from the fact that Jesus was raised again, you will never be able to see yourself being raised. So the ultimate historical basis, the ultimate historical basis of all true hope rests on this on the resurrection of Jesus. Because without the resurrection of Jesus, life would not only be hopeless, but it would be meaningless. Peter goes on to say this in 1 Peter 1.13, therefore, gird up your loin, the loins of your mind. Now he's speaking about our mental state. He says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully, fully. Don't take any part of your hope 
and pin it and anchor it to a change in circumstance. The moment you do that, folks, you pin and anchor your hope to a movable object, to a circumstance that you've got no control over. He says this, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, let me help unpack that so you can see clearly what Peter is saying and what it means for us. Peter is saying here that the process of salvation is not yet complete. You heard him. He said this, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought, is to be brought. He's speaking to Christians, people that have already been born again. So what is this grace that he speaks about that is to be brought to us? Well, Peter is saying here that through the process, the process of salvation is not yet complete. It is going to be ultimately consummated by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, what that means is when Jesus comes back again to fetch us in the twinkling of an eye at the trumpet call of God, I promise you now, not only are you gonna be changed, but your circumstances are gonna be changed in the blink of an eye. We've got friends right now that are facing a death sentence according to science. They've got a, they're facing a death sentence according to science. And I'm saying to you, you know what? Life won't get better when the healing comes. Life is better because Jesus is coming back. It's better already, hallelujah. It's better already, hallelujah. And although the healing is already manifest and we thank God for it, not for one second, I've told him, not for one second, do you talk about, you know what, I can live again when I'm well. No, 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 you live now. Because guess what? Our hope ultimately is at the top of the mountain, not at the hook that's been pinned just in front of our eyes. It's there. Jesus is coming back. If I can stir your hearts tonight and get you to understand something, if you've made the mistake, if you've made the mistake at any point in time, for those of you watching online, and you've been deceived into thinking, if this thing changes, your life is gonna be, your life will change. That's not what the Bible says. Our hope is to be fully in the return of Jesus. In other words, the ultimate focus of all Christian hope must be on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in Hebrews 3 verse 6. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. He was faithful over us and the Bible says we are them. If we hold fast our confidence and boast of our hope firm until the end. Now listen as I read this portion. God's instruction to us is not to give up hoping. Hope's outward working is expression. It's not just a passive inward expectation of good, which is the, which is the example I shared with you, the definition I shared with you later, earlier on. It's not just a passive inward expectation of good, but just as importantly, our verbal communication to whoever would listen that again flows from within our hearts, establishing our souls, causing us to stand out amongst a hopeless and lost people. There are enough hopeless people out there, folks. And you know why they're hopeless? Because they're waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for their circumstances to change. God is a God of hope. Surely we as children should be full of hope all the time. And I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to you. I was having a bri at my fire pit the other night with our, doctor, with our doctors next door who my wife and I are witnessing to. And, and before I knew it, we got caught up in a conversation with what's going on in the country and where we're headed towards. And I tell you what, I felt I was so down after that. I got sucked into the whole thing. And I realized, listen, that I've got a huge dose of negativity and hopelessness. And instead of, instead of coming out knowing that Jesus is coming back, and that is the anchor of my soul, saying, listen, it doesn't matter what happens over here. Jesus is coming back to fetch me and all this is gonna be details. Instead of saying that, I got sucked into the vortex. And I realized I was exactly the same as them. In actual fact, I was a better moaner than they were. I got the goal, I got first prize. Keith came in third. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We have got to stand out in the crowd, folks. And I'm saying it's something that happens in our spirits. Because when you put your hope firmly and squarely 
on the fact that Jesus is coming back again, it'll affect the way you speak. When you're in company with people that have no hope, I tell you folks, we are cursed without Christ. No wonder they linger and they live day by day just hoping something will change tomorrow and hoping something will change the next day and hoping something will change and nothing changes. And the book of Proverbs says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. We're living in a world with people whose hearts are sick because they haven't ultimately placed their hope in Jesus. They haven't ultimately placed their hope that Jesus will return. And as a result, they've got no faith that He can and that's why they don't run to Him. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We have a responsibility to be the most hopeful people within the sphere of influence around us, in our families. And when people ask us, how can you be so hopeful? When you see everything that's going on around you, you can tell them, which is the biblical response. You can tell them, I can't even explain why. I'm so optimistic about the future. I can't explain why, but what I can tell you is I believe it's because I, I know that it's because Jesus is coming back one day and He's coming to fetch me and I'm gonna be seated with Him and I'm gonna live in eternity with Him. There'll be no more tears, no more pain. There'll be no more drought, no more famine. There'll be no unemployment. There'll be no poverty. There'll be no sickness. I know that Jesus is coming back for me one day and it makes everything all right now. Can someone say praise the Lord? This life, folks, as important as what you may feel it is, is but a vapour. I make, I make my wife coffee in bed every morning. I do a lot of things wrong, but some things I do right. And this is one of them. <laughs> she gets coffee in bed every single morning of her life. And most nights she get a foot rub before she goes to sleep, if she's good. But anyway, but, but I was making her coffee early in the week and I was watching the kettle boil. And I noticed how, especially now in winter, the steam comes out and it's, it's just gone. And I was reminded, my life is that. It's a vapor. And yet sometimes we can get so consumed in something that in the light of eternity is just a fraction of, you see, when you become hopeful, you become eternity minded. And I will close with this illustration. And this is, an, this is, this is the devil's this is the devil's strategy. He wants to get our eyes on the now. And I'm not dismissing the stuff that people go through. I'm not dismissing it. I've been through stuff. I've been through stuff. I nearly wrecked my marriage. I nearly completely alienated my children from, I've been through stuff. But it's a moment. If you were to span, if you were to span a tape measure, a simple tape measure from the most northern tip of Africa, running it all the way down through Egypt, Kenya, South Africa to the point, the Cape of Good Hope. Imagine you, you spun that, that tape measure all the way through there and then you made your way all the way up to the north in Egypt and you looked at the first millimeter on that tape measure. The rest of that tape, that would be your life. In actual fact, that first millimeter would be eternity. You'd still have, hold, have the whole tape measured. It's, it's a moment. It's a fraction. That's why God counsels us and says, when you get born again, you are born again into a living hope. Now you may have forgotten that and I'm here tonight to remind both myself and remind you that ultimately our hope is pinned on the return of Jesus. It changes everything. It gives you strength as the scripture says. You draw courage. There's a steadfastness. Here's a man who collapsed in my office just a few short years ago when his wife was diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer. Paul, stand up for a moment. I witnessed and I walked a life of faith with him and you've heard him teach on it. 
but he'll be the first to tell you there was a point where he was just completely hopeless. He didn't know whether his life would ever come right again. He didn't know whether God would ever be able to bring him another wife. For personal reasons, he didn't believe that that would ever happen. He thought at one point because the devil got him to focus everything, all of his attention on the now. But guess what? Jesus rocked up, eh, Paul? I'm telling you now, Jesus rocked up. And Paul realized that there is a hope beyond my wife making it through this. That my life doesn't depend on whether she lives or dies. But you know what? My hope is in the return of Jesus. And the moment Paul shifted his eyes and put them back on the Lord, guess what? Healing came. And today, you know, he's married Elaine and they've had a beautiful baby, Hannah, and families restored. God has done. And guess what? He doesn't even mention it anymore. It's part of his testimony. Why Jesus is coming back. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're facing, but there is a man standing there. There is Andrew. I'm here to tell you, you know what? It's going to be okay. And not because, not because it's just going to be okay, but because Jesus is coming back. Can someone say praise the Lord? Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.